Hello, and welcome back. We are now ready for our final two panels of the day. Um, and so I want to just give a, a brief overview of what is ahead um, and introduce our STEAM panel in a moment. Um, we are about to have our funders panel. And seamlessly, following the funders panel, we'll have our closing response conversation between Jane Golden and Patty Phillips. So if you are inclined or called to a bio break of any kind, there will not be a break between the two sessions, so please um, kindly move in and out of the room as needed. I also want to make sure uh, to, to remind you that following these two seamless back-to-back -back panels, <laughs> there will be a closing reception in the lobby with beer, wine, other goodies. So um, we hope that you'll stay with us through the remainder of the program. Now, I am very happy to introduce our funders panel. We have with us Denise Brown from the Leeway Foundation, Beth Feldman Brandt from Stockton Rush Bartol, Laura Koloski from the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage, and we are joined by our moderator today, Jermaine Ingram. Yeah, we're so esteemed. <laughs> yeah, I feel like um, this room is still vibrating from that last la that last conversation, and it's uh, uh, a bit of a um, fearsome environment for us to enter. You know, this is a board foundation um, sitting up here. So we want to approach this both from the perspective of having um, of, of talking about um, what these individual organizations do, but we also want to look at um, the broader ecology of funding for uh, for arts and culture and what um, what Denise and Beth and Laura have uh, learned and perceived, operating from their particular perspectives and looking at um, and looking at both. How, um, how the issues of inclusion and impact and scale affect the, the shape of the giving that these, or, that, that these organizations do, and also how their organizations affect how inclusion, scale, and, uh, and impact is, um, is activated in the arts and culture and ecology in which we live. So I'm, go I'm going to ask um, each person, let's start with you, Denise. Um, just ask each person to talk about what kind of giving, what type of funding um, Leeway does, and talk about what distinctive role your organization plays in the broader ecology of arts funding in Philadelphia. Okay. Um, how many people in the room are not familiar with Leeway? Could you raise your hands? Roberto, that's not true. <laughs> um, so for those of you who don't know, um, the Leeway Foundation um, is a Philadelphia-based foundation that supports women and trans artists who create art for social change or are working at the intersection of social justice issues and arts and culture. Um, we provide uh, grants, project-based grants, or small project-based grants for up to $2,500, and then we have an award called the Transformation Award, which is a $15,000 award um, given for practitioners who have been working at that intersection for at least five years or more. And we did that so that we'd be, be able to honor people sort of in the beginning of their practice. I'm looking at Julia because she was one of the creators of this uh, process. Um, we wanted to be able to support those people who were at the beginning of their practice as well as acknowledging the elders in the cultural and artistic community here in Philadelphia. Um, we fund in the Philadelphia metropolitan area, which includes Camden, New Jersey. Um, and over the years, 
uh, we've begun to develop other programs to support our constituencies because we have very limited resources um, and we wanted to find a way to be able to include um, more folks um, in our work. And so as I say to the people that work at Leeway, we're not a programming organization. We do programs in service of the other work that we do. Um, I would also say that we spend resources, time, effort, energy, um, and money on actually accessing those people that we think should be applying um, for our grants because, you know, I'm thinking about all the things I've heard earlier today. And so uh, a number of years ago, the board of directors of Leeway decided that it was preferable for us to go deeper in our work um, in terms of this region than to start thinking more expansively. And so what that means for us is really um, putting forth the effort to really identify those people who may not even be thinking of themselves in the context of art, because that's a very privileged position. Um, and so we're helping um, those folks find us as well. Is that enough for now? OK. So the, the Bartel Foundation, we have sort of two big chunks of work. We make grants to um, in-depth arts education programs in the city of Philadelphia, and uh, that can be in, in from preschool to adults to seniors, and, and can happen anywhere. So our version of arts education is pretty broad. Uh, then we um, present professional, free professional development workshops for teaching artists. So all of you who are here who are teaching artists who aren't on our list, you should be on our list. And so we present about 25 programs a year that are free that look at um, either teaching practice, uh, artists as entrepreneurs, marketing and, and business programs, and then some new work we're doing, because I'm looking at Melissa over here, that we call Artist Plus, which is trying to get artists in rooms with other folks that we think should be working with artists. So we, we've done programs around Artist Plus literacy and trauma-informed practice and CBCs and community-based organizations that aren't arts organizations. Um, we're a one and a half, well, Michelle is, Michelle Angelo Ortiz is the program manager. I can, she works three days a week, but I can't say she's like half person. She's like 10 times a person. Um, but essentially we're a two person foundation. Uh, we just made our grants for this year. We gave $120,000, $115,000 to 22 organizations between $5,000 and $7,500. <coughs> so I'm Laura Plasky and I'm here from the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage. We are actually a, a grantee of Pew. We're funded by the Pew Charitable Trust um, and we work in the five county area. So Philadelphia, Bucks, Montgomery, <coughs> Delaware, and um, the other county I forgot, Chester um, <laughs> County. <laughs> Um, and um, we, most of our funding is concentrated in two program areas. The one I work in, which is exhibitions and public interpretation, which is a lot of words to mean um, essentially all kinds of exhibition programs from um, sort of, uh, you know, exhibitions of contemporary or historical art um, to, for instance, we supported a <clears throat> project at the Fairmont Waterworks that allowed them to develop a sort of um, freshwater mussel incubator um, that will reintroduce the freshwater mussel population to the Schuylkill River, um, and then an interpretive visit, uh, exhibit that describes the value of freshwater mussels to the ecosystem. Um, and we also have a funding area in performance. Um, the decisions in those um, uh, granting programs are made by an outside um, a group of peer reviewers, so um, the job of me and my colleagues is to um, try to help our uh, applicants um, develop a compelling proposal that um, responds to our criteria, and then we turn those decisions over to, a, a, as I say, a group from outside of the Philadelphia area. Um, we also have a, a fellowships program. Um, every year we award 12 fellowships for individual artists, or sometimes artists working in teams. Um, and those are not project-based, so those are um, just awards of $75,000 that are intended to support the artist in continuing their work. Um, we also make advancement grants, um, which are for major business model shifts at institutions as they really change their way of working over several years. 
Um, and one of the ways that I think, um, maybe that we think of ourselves as distinct in the ecology is that we also think of ourselves as a place that offers um, sort of capacity building um, to um, continue to sort of help um, practitioners build their skills and their knowledge base and make connections with other practitioners. And, um, and we call ourselves a, a hub for knowledge, um, which means that we do publications and, um, and uh, interview practitioners that um, come to visit us from out of town and um, put those on our website to sort of share um, insights around cultural practice. Um, the, I guess the last thing I wanted to say was just that as a funder, we don't have a particular focus on social change or social justice, but certainly a lot of the work that we've been responding to, that you know, people have been bringing to us, um, especially in the last five years, we've seen more and more of that. And, and we did go through a restructuring of, um, almost five years ago now that um, responds in part to that, although it responds to other kinds of shifts. Um, we used to fund in more distinctive disciplinary silos, um, for instance, public history, visual arts, dance, theater, music, and, and now by combining those programs into the two, that I, two main programs I mentioned earlier, um, it allows us to support um, projects that didn't really fit into any of those particular buckets. Um, and one of the ways that that has, I think, has increased our ability to respond to real community-based programming that isn't just about history and it isn't just about art, but it might be about both of those things or, or neither or, or those things and more. Um, so I guess I'll stop there. Um, Denise? You've been working on um, inclusion, not just at the local level with, with Leeway, but also in your capacity as a board member of Grantmakers in the Arts, and in particular um, through a, 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 was a think tank um, that focuses on inclusion and equity. Can you talk a bit about um, what you've been doing in that context and um, what lessons you've learned about um, inclusiveness in the philanthropic area um, with regard to inclusion and also how that might relate to scale and impact? Wow, small question. So I am part of a racial equity committee of the board of Grant Makers in the Arts that started um, as what they call the Thought Leaders Forum. Um, and uh, part of the beginning of that work, it was part of my being on the board of GIA, uh, was that we all went through sort of a truncated version of the People's Institute's anti-racism training. Um, how many people know about the People's Institute? Do I need to do a sentence? Um, so the People's Institute is an organization that is based in New Orleans. Um, it's called the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond, and they've been doing work around anti-racism, you know, for decades now, um, and often are seen as kind of the model for that kind of work. Um, and so board members and other folks were invited to go through this process. I think initially the idea was that we would go through a two and a half day training and come up with ways to end racism in philanthropy and kind of move on with our lives. Um, but coming out of that, um, there were those of us who were part of that group who said that this really needs to be a learning community and this is just the beginning of this work. Um, and the board decided to take it on. Um, since then, um, every board member of Grantmakers in the Arts now is required to go through this training um, when they first come onto the board. Um, and we're currently in the process of developing a racial equity training um, that will be offered to members of uh, Grant Makers of the Arts, similar to a workshop that was about capitalization that they did a few years ago. Um, and so um, funds have been raised. Uh, we're going to test it out at the conference this year in October and hope to roll it out next year. Uh, what have I learned? Um, you know, I've learned that some of these issues related to equity are deeply entrenched um, because they do raise these questions of privilege, class, and race, um, uh, very much so, and in terms of the ways in which resources are distributed. So, Grandmakers in the Arts put out a racial equity statement uh, recently um, that 
is suggesting that people should make a commitment to supporting a lot of organizations, which are you know, African, Latin, Arab, Native American, and I'm forgetting something right now. Um, and so the, we're sort of at the beginning of this work, um, and I see it um, certainly as long-term work. I think it was Aviva that said something about 100 years or, you know, sort of really, um, really understanding uh, that these issues are deeply entrenched and they're not going to turn around quickly. Um, and so we need to be committed to making longer-term commitments, um, both to our practice as philanthropic institutions, but also in terms of those individuals and organizations that we support. Feel free to jump in and ask a question or make a comment at, at any point. Well, I, I want to ask you, Beth, um, I took a look at your website, okay, and it said, our work includes offering many grants each year to small arts organizations who are making big impact. You remember? You remember? <laughs> so um, maybe you can talk a bit about what strategy um, Mark Paul uses to determine where there is potential for, for impact and where you see tensions and how you resolve tensions be, um, between this endeavor to fund specifically small, uh, fund small organizations and your intention to have impact. Um, well, it's something we're actually digging into right now where we're, we've always been sort of a responsive, people need something in our community, artists need something, and we do it. And uh, we've never had a strategic plan, we've never, you know, we just do things. And so that's really engaging and great, um, but we actually have stepped back and uh, had somebody at another foundation actually challenge us to say, are you doing the work the smartest way you could be doing it? And should, does your structure make sense? Does your focus make sense? And, and so um, I think we always, uh, and if we look at arts, ed arts education and community organizations, so we look at depth always. And so if we're looking at um, a program where people are engaged, you know, play on Philly every day after school for three hours, 52 weeks a year, is sort of the one end of the scale. Um, and then the other end, somebody comes in and says, we're going to do three visits and they're going to come to a show, which is really not enough for us. So we look at um, how deep they're going, and we always kind of default to that. We try and um, it's interesting because we're getting some of our interviews back from our consultant um, and people, small groups see us as sort of a seal of approval that then helps them leverage bigger grants. So if we were, we were one of the first grants or maybe the first grant to the Tibetan Association um, or um, I think Warrior Writers we just gave a grant to. And so we try and be broader in how we think about credentials and how we think about eligibility and how we, you know, we visit everybody before they can apply for a grant. So that informs a lot of what we do. It's not all about the paper. And so we do look for what's an organization that's um, just doing good work and they can use a little bit of money because uh, we don't get that much. And honestly, sometimes those groups don't keep going. Um, they're small, they're volunteer-led, they're the passion of one person who kind of burns themselves out or moves or something. And so we don't assume that every grant we make is going to go on forever, is going to be the grant that propels them to become a million-dollar organization. Uh, we just really work at the, the content of what we're doing. I was thinking earlier when um, Magda was talking that one of the things I wanted to add to the conversation about scale was the question of risk. Um, and so I think what you're saying sort of speaks to that. Um, and when I think about leeway, we don't, you know, I always say to people that the, the artists and cultural producers who apply to us define what a cultural practice looks like. Um, and so we, we discovered, you know, trends, we'll see three or four applications in a cycle that are speaking to issues 
um, like Afrofuturism, for example, or um, lately we've been seeing a lot of things that are related to questions of um, wellness and sort of health justice, um, you know, and people kind of working in that context. And so, so I think that we have to be open to taking those risks with people, and they're not all going to be successful. I think Roberto said yesterday, scale and failing forward. And so I think we have to think about that as well. And I think another benefit, we, we um, because we make relatively small grants, $5,000, and we're out in the community all the time, we do maybe 60 site visits in a year, we get to see some things like, we're like, oh, five different groups are having this problem with the school district. Or, you know, well, let's get them together, or there's some big thing, or we should do a workshop, or we should do a program. Um, and the other benefit of not giving people a lot of money is they actually tell you what's going on. Um, because they're, sorry, they're not <laughs> and, and, and I'm sure, like, your staff are kind of digging in because you have two-year projects, so you, you know that what I wrote a year ago to get a project that's going to start in nine months, that's going to last two years, is going to change. Um, but I think one benefit of our smaller scale is that we can have pretty honest conversations with people because we're out talking to them and seeing them. Um, and that they can change their mind or it didn't work and they come back and say, we have to postpone this, we're not ready. Um, and so that's a benefit just to, you know, the risk isn't that big to talk to us either because they're not going to come in and have um, somebody say, well, now we're taking like a big grant away. And usually they know we can help them because we're out, we know somebody who's dealt with this, we can connect you with someone who's had a similar problem. And so the, I think there's a beauty in a small scale, not that I wouldn't like a lot more money, but um, there is that different kind of intimate relationship, which is still a power relationship. We still have the money and you don't, and, and that's a thing. Like, no matter how nice we are, in the end we give you a grant or we don't. Um, but, but there is that benefit of risk both ways for the grantee and for us. I'll just jump in a yeah, little bit about risk too. Yeah, that um, one of the things I didn't say in my introduction was that our um, sort of our overarching um, uh, reason for being in terms of you know the way we um, award our project grants is really about allowing our applicants, whether they're organizations or individuals, to do something they couldn't do otherwise, to go beyond their um, usual uh, way of working. Um, and that is, you know, there's risk inherent in that. If you're doing something you've never done before, you're taking some kind of a chance. Um, and we have, um, historically we've asked on our application about that, you know, and we, we often, we've used the phrase informed risk, um, you know, because we are making, <laughs> we are making, you know, grants of more than $5,000, so we're, but, but, but also because of that, that very sense that, um, you know, a risk, e even when it doesn't, when when you don't do what you think you were going to do, or don't learn what you thought you were going to learn, or have the results you thought you were going to have, um, if you structured your process in the right way, it's still a learning experience, it's still something that propels you forward, right? Um, and so that's sort of built into our process as well, is asking people, and, and one of the things that we've learned over time is that for our applicants, what that risk is can look very different um, depending on the kind of organization it is or the kind of work they've done um, previously. So that's really why we try to ask them to tell us, you know, what does that look like? What, where's the risk in this for you, and what's at stake um, in doing this process, and what, you know, what's the potential for what might result in terms of what you might learn, whether it goes the way you expect or not. Um, I want to come back to you, Laura, because um, you mentioned that it was almost five years ago that um, the center dramatically changed its, its structure and its process. And I remember going to a meeting when that happened and going and, and leaving that meeting with this palpable fear, um, having, heard, <laughs> having heard the statement that we are interested in funding big ideas. 
Yeah. Um, and I really had this fear at that time that this notion of big ideas and the change in the process would result in um, small organizations or individual artists or these small, elegant projects not being in a position to be competitive with organizations that could you know, pull more bells and, and blow, more, blow more whistles. Um, could, could you talk about, and I should say that um, I, I, I'm really grateful for the fact that those fears, I don't feel, that, I don't think now that those fears were justified and I think that this latest round of grants is an indication of um, the breadth of the, um, of the kind of art making that Pew is willing to fund. Um, but will you talk a bit about some strategies or some, um, some programs that the center pursues in order to ensure that artists know about the opportunities that are avail available and that they feel that they have a fair chance of being competitive in that very rigorous process? And I'm glad to hear you say that you feel like that hasn't resulted in the way, certainly there was a lot of concern about that, and it was something we were well aware of and, and, and wanted to, you know, wanted to respond positively to, um, of course. I mean, um, I guess I'll just start by saying our, our sort of regular way of working is that, um, uh, is that we do meet pretty intensively with everybody who's interested in applying to us. So we do try to, and, the, and those meetings are intended to uh, be, um, you know, as I said, sort of a, a way of helping um, anybody who's in our process move forward in it, and, and we give um, what we hope is good advice in terms of, um, you know, sort of responding to the kinds of questions we ask and knowing, um, you know, the way our panel process works, trying to be, um, you know, well prepared for that. But we also do some other programming. I mentioned, um, you know, that we, we do a, a wide variety of, um, you know, capacity building programs. and. Um, one of the things that I think, um, you know, that we've been able to do a lot more of since the restructuring is just um, whatever the program is, whether it's, um, you know, having a speaker in a carrier from some other part of the world say, um, to come in and talk about their work or, um, or, or sometimes we take people to see other work somewhere else and try to talk about it, you know, uh, with each other is that um, because we sort of have um, started to break down these disciplinary boundaries that um, we often involve people from very different kinds of practice in those um, in those programs and I do think that that has done a lot towards um, both allowing us to sort of expand our own network and and know people doing work that um, we might not have known before because it sort of you know continues to work circularly and we work our way out and and, and, and meet new people and, and new people know about us. Um, but also that opportunity to talk to practitioners whose work is different from your own and learn from that and be connected with um, people doing different kinds of work and, and understand how that might, um, uh, might be an opportunity to learn something about you know, the way your own um, practice works. Um, and then to be a little bit more specific, um, we were actually just talking at the break about a a program we've been doing um, for the last couple of years, I think since the restructuring, um, that we call Project Test Kitchen, um, that happens in the summer. You know, our grant cycle is a yearly grant cycle, and um, the first step of the process is in the fall. So we try to start, um, we start doing a lot of work, you know, just um, getting in touch with people um, who we think could potentially be applicants to us and could have a project that um, might. Uh, might resonate in our process and um, we just start trying to have conversations with them but we have this more formal program that we've done where we invite people who we, again who we think um, both that they have a, um, the potential to bring an interesting project to the center um, but that they also have the sort of generosity of spirit that would allow them to um, uh, really engage with other practitioners and talk about their projects and so it, it really is just um, it's an opportunity to talk to each other about their projects um, and, and answer questions and ask questions. And then we also bring back panelists from our previous panels. Um, so people who've made decisions on, in previous years about um, who's, which projects would be funded, they come back and talk to all of those practitioners also as a way of helping them understand the practice better, uh, or excuse me, the process better, but also to ask, you know, to, to provide them with additional resources of, you know, 
do you know about the work that so and so is doing? Or, you know, in this you know in this part of the world, or um, uh, you know, to help them draw um, larger connections and uh, and tap into those to tap further into those big ideas that you were talking about. That um, and just to finish up with that, that you know. Um, uh, the, you know, the phrase big ideas is, is um, difficult and, and maybe wasn't the one we should have used and is maybe still not the one we should use, but um, because we're not talking about big in scale, um, you know, we're talking about big in the sense that it has depths or it has resonance or it has value to a particular group of people um, and that the project really reflects those ideas. Um, and we do fund a variety of scales of projects, certainly we do fund that some that have very large audiences and they're big in that sense, but we also fund projects that are quite small and have, um, as you know, um, uh, people were talking about in the last panel about, um, you know, a project that goes really deep for maybe a very small group of people, but, um, you know, but, but could be life-changing potentially for a group of 10 people. Um, that's something that has, there's room for that in our process as well. Um, I, I want to go back to the last panel and, and this discussion about, and I guess the, this embroiders on something you said a couple of minutes ago, this notion of the long arc that impact takes. And um, I, I was wondering if I could just get some thoughts from you about the, um, how your funding re responds to the amount of time that um, it takes to see to see change happen, and of course the, the center isn't specifically focused on social change, but the application itself asks for what's going to be the impact on the field. And so there are similar questions about how does change happen and over what period of time, where do you see, how do you measure it, how do you, how do you um, frame your benchmarks? Yeah, we're going to jump over. <laughs> <laughs> um, I should disclose that Jermaine is on my board, and this is a conversation that I've been having for the last, <laughs> the last few years. Um, I'm not sure how to answer that. I mean, and, and some of it has to do with scale. You know, we get these small project grants. Um, as, as you were talking, I was thinking about how I'm always uh, surprised and excited about how that money is used to see things that then, you know, you talked about warrior writers. We gave Lavella an Art and Change grant six years ago when she was developing that concept, or people who have gone on to receive money from Pew that received money. You know, so it's this idea of um, being that first opportunity that people then can leverage and use that as part of their cultural history to go on and do other things. Um, I, I also should say that one of the innovations that we came up with at Leeway is we, um, people are not allowed to submit resumes to us. Um, we have something we call an experience page. Um, and so we ask people to give us a list of one to 10 um, things that have occurred in their life that have had a deep impact on their practice. And, I, you know, again, never cease to be amazed by the kinds of things they disclose that have affected um, how they move in the world, and, and, and sometimes they're very personal, and so we we sort of hold those stories as well. Um, and then I always say, you know, sort of underneath everything is relationships, right? And so um, within, you know, we find opportunities to bring grantees together, um, that we bring, we have a national panel that um, deliberates around the transformation award um, and try to find those synergies and connections and hopefully people find ways to work together because for us this work is movement building, right? And so we're really interested in how people make connections, develop relationships and build them over long periods of time. Well, it's something that we're thinking about because we, um, as I said, it, I feel like we we just have faith in people that are doing good work, and so um, we do want to know, like, here's what you thought, like, we just changed our final report uh, 
maybe two years ago. So there is a little quantitative, like, what zip code did you work with? And how long was the average experience for somebody in your program? Um, but then we say, you know, our whole report is like, tell us a story of something that went, like, just as you hoped it would go. And tell us a story of something that was really challenging and how you dealt with it. And so it's sort of three stories that we ask people to tell us. Um, and we talked a little before, part of our idea of scale is being um, realistic about how big the application should be for this amount of money, how much, you know, we sort of feel like in our application, we, you, you're supposed to demonstrate to us, like, what did you learn? Tell us something that you learned from formal or informal assessment and a change you made. We want to know that you're an organization that's paying attention. And an amazing amount of people don't actually answer that question that we ask them. They give us like, we do surveys, and 87% of them are like, that's not what we asked you. Um, but that being said, we try and make sure the scale of what we're expecting and what we're asking is appropriate to the amount of money we're giving. And then we kind of have faith that we've been to your place, we've seen you do the work, we believe it's good work, here's some money. Um, but we are talking now uh, kind of about that, what is our belief in change? Um, because is it that we fund really small groups and we help them get bigger grants than we can give them? Is it we put more energy into our teaching artist work? Because we know from some of our surveys that, you know, in a year, one teaching artist teaches at six different places. So if we raise the caliber of their training, does that ripple out faster? But then, does coming to one program for three hours and leaving with three new things to do in your classroom, is that enough impact on a teaching artist that's going out in the world, or do we have to do something deeper? So we actually, you know, is it about just raising the profile of this field of community arts and arts education and teaching artists as a profession, and do we need to put more energy um, of our one and a half time people staff uh, into uh, telling stories better and, and raising the profile of the foundation as a way to rose, raise the profile of our grantees. Because um, we're always sort of like, no, we're just doing our work, but, you know. But there is um, sort of, we have to kind of, I think, get over our, like our self-deprecatingness because it, it isn't helping the field if we're too quiet because we think we don't have that big an impact. And so by you know, we're doing more social media and more website and more whatever so that we raise the profile of the people we believe in and then maybe that has the bigger impact. That's what we're trying to figure out. We'll get back to you in a couple of years. <laughs> I'll look for that. I don't, I'm not sure I have much useful to add. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about as Beth was talking was that um, we ask some similar questions on our final report. We ask a lot of sort of institutional questions about, you know, what did you do? How did it work? You know, that sort of thing. And, but then we ask this separate set of questions um, we call critical analysis that um, ask the person who was sort of the programmatic or artistic center of the project to respond to from their own perspective as a practitioner. Um, and they are the kinds of questions that um, Beth was talking about in terms of like, tell us about, you know, tell us about what was hard and, and what did you do about it, you know, and tell us about, um, you know, where things didn't go the way you expected and also, you know, tell us about what was good and, and um, you know, and, and, and what were the resources that allowed you to do this, what would you want in place the next time and, um, and our reason for doing that really is about to understand impact, I think, you know, both the impact of our funding, of course, but um, more specifically the impact on the, on the practitioners, you know, like what, what did it mean to try and do something that was new for you? Um, and because, you know, because it never does go exactly as, the way, as you're expecting, so what did that mean? And, and we try to use those as a way of understanding in the future, you know, um, when an organization takes on this particular kind of work, we found that, you know, they need more in, you know, they need more support in this particular area than, um, than they often understand going into it or whatever and try to help them build that in, you know, other applicants in the future, whether it's the same one who's come back to us or new applicants, try to help them build that into their work. Um, I'm going to ask one more question, sort of broad question for the three of you, and then I'm going to open this up to, um, to the audience. 
And you know, each of you from your from your different perspectives um, on the, the funding ecology has a sense of where there are gaps, where there are missed opportunities for funders to have uh, an impact on uh, on impact, on scale, and on inclusiveness in in, our, in this particular area, in this region. Um, do you want to? Can any of you speak to what what you see? I mean, one of the things that that's clear is increasingly there's general operating money given to. Um, organizations because there's increased understanding of the fact that you know you can go bankrupt doing programs. <laughs> I guess I would just say that a lot of the work that we see is sort of the iterative nature of the work that people are doing and so to see work develop over time you know I'm thinking about a piece that you did about the president's house that I saw at least three different times over a period of two years um, and the willingness for funders to, to continue to put money into work that, that sort of has a longer time horizon, I think, is a big gap, right? Like, um, everybody's sort of looking for that, I don't know, it, and, and I think that speaks to the priorities of the foundation more so than the practitioners. Um, so perhaps the funder needs to have sort of new juicy, sexy ideas, um, and the idea of supporting a project that's now in its third year um, doesn't have the juice of funding the new. So I think we need to look at that. And I think there is um, there is a, a cycle for uh, organizations that either represent or run by people of color that um, they're in this cycle of, we can't give you enough money because you don't have enough money. And um, and it's um, it's really hard, and so um, there are some organizations where, again, because it's low risk and not that much money, we're like, yeah, we know your we know your financials suck, but you know, you're an iconic whatever. You're you're the person in this community doing this work. We know you've had, you know. I mean, we, we, try to, we try to put our money where we think the work is really good, and there are enough people around, and there's not so much transition and tumult that you're like, who the hell knows what would happen if we gave this to you? Um, but I think that's a, it's a huge problem. There are just a lot of organizations, uh, again, either run by people of color or in those communities that the standards of what is good practice boxes them out of funding um, for bigger dollars than us. And the bigger dollars are, are what they need. And once you're in that loop of deficit or you're in the loop of turnover, um, I don't know how they dig out of it. And so, you know, we throw our little bits of money here and there. And then there are some that you're like, okay, there's too much agitation and the financials are too bad. And, and we're not really sure what the work is, so I'm not saying we're indiscriminate about where we give money, because we think very hard about it. Um, but I think there are just systems that are weighted against uh, either people that aren't credentialed in the right way, or aren't um, structured in a way that makes sense, and you, they get in this spiral, and I don't know how you get out of it. And that's really frustrating, because we can't fix it. I'm basically going to repeat what Denise said, but um, maybe add something new. We'll see. Um, that um, you know, my first thought was time as well, and you know, we feel this really acutely at the center because our um, funding is project based. So um, you know, every time a new app applicant comes back to us, they have to have something new. You know, it's not about coming back for the good work they already did, and and we are certainly aware that that's a challenge. But also in terms of um, you know, the more practice we see that really is about deep community engagement or social practice or, um, you know, um, all of that kind of work that has to develop over time um, because there's so much relationship building that has to happen in them. And um, certainly, you know, we're sort of, we're aware of the challenges of, you know, our longest project is two years. And, um, and that really isn't uh, enough time to build those kinds of relationships and, and how, you know, um, how we are able to respond to that sort of thing. I mean, um, you know, 
the response we have in place right now is that we offer, you know, essentially a planning grant um, we call Discovery that allows people to start that process in a one-year process and then they could come back to us for a project grant that would allow them to continue for two more years. But even still, three years is a short time. And, um, you know, um, so that's something um, we don't currently have any kind of a response to it, but it's certainly something that's on, um, on our minds in terms of, um, you know, really supporting good and ethical practice with communities. I'm going to open the floor for questions. Um, We've got like 10 minutes, so we can collect a few. I can shout. OK, I can shout. It's mad that I can't shout. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I guess, I, you know, I've been really thinking about this, I, this, right, this issue of time, right? the arc of time. And and I wonder if you guys have any thoughts around actually, okay, so I'll try and make this quick. Um, the, you know, I had a professor once who said, history doesn't repeat itself, it insists, right? And so it may return to what looks like the same issue over time, but it's returning with different people under different circumstances, right? And so I kind of apply that to life, <laughs> life itself. And I was wondering if you, um, give any thought or if you think there are ways to actually support organizations who may actually be talking about their work as if it's the same when it actually isn't, right? Because there is an evolution, right? There's always an evolution. And um, if you guys have found readings about it or thought about it or, or talked about it, because I think organizations and artists also get trapped because it's hard to see yourself, to see how your work actually has evolved. So that's something that you've been doing for a long time is actually not the same as when you did it five years ago. Is that, I'm trying to phrase a question. I'm, I'm, yeah, working I'm not sure this is even the answer, but uh, one of the things we started doing is giving feedback to everyone who applies to us, mm -hmm. whether they ask for it or not. <laughs> so like, good news, bad news. Um, and what's happened as a result of that is people have contacted us and said, oh, now I know why I'm not getting the grant, because uh -huh. there's something that I'm not articulating mm -hmm. in my application. Um, and so because we have a process where we'll work very closely with people through that application process, um, and, and now the new program director, Sarzia Ibrahimi, is also mm -hmm. sort of trying to set up kind of buddy systems. Yeah. So someone who received a transformation award identifies someone else who they think should be applying and works them through that process. Mm -hmm. um, but we also believe in the autonomy of the artist, and right? So you need to be able to tell us what you're doing. We're not going to do it for you, right? But right. we'll support you in that. So, so I think this idea of giving really direct feedback yeah. to people so that they can hear what it is they're saying to you, yeah. repeat it back to them. So let's say that as somebody who writes a lot of grants for myself <laughs> and, and other people, um, it, I, I, I have this sort of mantra for myself that it's not worth applying to an organization that can't write a good enough application um, to, to help me learn about what's important in my practice mm -hmm. and how that practice is evolving. Mm -hmm. I'll just add quickly, one of the things that we, um, that I think sort of responds to your question, Magda, is that um, we've been really encouraging people to work with, um, sort of as I was mentioning earlier, you know, work across disciplines or with somebody who um, can ask you questions, you know, that um, that really force you to articulate, you know, um, what your uh, what what it is you're doing and why it matters, you know. Um, and sometimes we found that that really it does often that works better when it's somebody who isn't sort of already embedded in, um, in the kind of work that you do. And, um, you know, we've, we've even gone so far as to sort of um, uh, formalize that in our application. We ask everybody to have what we call a thinking partner um, on the work who's sort of there to, you know, to keep sort of poking at you and ask you, you know, and make suggestions and keep asking questions as you um, work your way through the, um, work your way through first the application and then the project itself. Hi, so question here. Um, thinking, Denise, about something you said, or your, the context of your work with grant makers in the arts, and Beth, some of the work about being catalytic, you know, as a, making small grants to, to organizations. I'm thinking if you could each speak um, to your role as fundraisers, in addition to being funders, 
Um, part of my day job is also is working as a program officer, and oftentimes people say to me, it must be um, so easy to give away money, and um, I've been trying to reframe my work in the context of actually my job is to raise additional money um, for the organizations that we either can't fund or we can't fund sufficiently. So um, I guess I'm, I'm asking in the broadest context of philanthropy, so not even to pigeonhole ourselves in arts philanthropy or Philly philanthropy, um, but just can you talk a little bit about how you see yourselves in the broader context of um, the, the hundreds of millions or actually billions of dollars that flies around um, in the field of philanthropy and is clearly, clearly not um, making it into the, the um, hands and studios and practices of um, artists doing really important work. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, so I see my, my participation in things like grant makers in the arts and the racial equity work that they're doing as um, a way of trying to help leverage resources for the kinds of things, the kind of work that Leeway cares about. Um, uh, you know, so my time um, in terms of going to convenings or being part of conversations with other funders and um, trying to provide ways of giving visibility to the work that we're supporting. You know, we, we're a little bit behind, but we've been doing these artist books that we sort of have a list of about 1,500 people that we send it out to, um, many of whom are national funders, to just sort of put that, the ideas and the concepts in front of them um, and have people thinking about it. So it's sort of like, how do we leverage what we're currently doing, giving them a limited amount of resources that we have to sort of engage people nationally in this conversation. So I see that as that work as well. I think our time is up. Um, Maybe we have time for one, one more. One more? Okay. I thought you were telling me one minute. Okay. <laughs> is there another question? Um, um, this is a question about your mission statement. Um, I'm wondering why you chose to support specifically trans artists as opposed to more generally queer artists. Um, um, Leeway will be celebrating its 25th anniversary next year. Um, it was founded by a Philadelphia-based artist, Linda Lee Alter. Um, the original mission was to support women. Um, in the arts, tradition, fairly traditional fine arts disciplines. Uh, when it first shifted, it was shifted to social change and then the inclusion of trans artists was seen as an extension of that feminist idea. Um, and so that's, that was really a decision around trans artists and not queer artists more specifically. Thank you all. Uh, I enjoy Thank you to our panelists and to our moderator, Jermaine Ingram. So, I'm going to, if the curtains could open.